Good afternoon, everyone. Glad you're here. It's glad I'm glad we're having a Bible class, and I'm glad we're doing it right now. Uh, if none of that makes any sense to you, it's okay. It doesn't make any sense to me either. Uh, I have uh, had this <clears throat> had this subject matter on my mind all week, and um, I am. Um, oh, I also realized I just changed. I, I need to change something. Hang on, Zoom. We'll be right back. All right, now I think I'm okay. I've had this subject matter on my mind basically more than a week because I um, came across some things that didn't sound right to me um, when I was listening to someone else speak. And uh, so I've been studying it a little bit here and there, and it would, it would come into my mind, and I'd study, and it'd go away, and I'd say, okay, well, I'll just forget it. And then uh, it would kind of back, pop back up. So I'm going to I'm going to start working in uh, in some doctrinal areas of the inside the book of Galatians but to do so I need in for my benefit I hope it's helpful to you too I need to set that up a little differently so turn in your bibles to Galatians 1 because we're going to be popping over there uh, from time to time here momentarily but also get Acts chapter 12 in Acts chapter 12 we're going to read first there and I want to recap something to you about Acts chapter uh, 1 through 12, if you'll allow me. You see, in Acts chapter 1 through 12, the apostles were active. When Christ ascended into heaven, they chose the 12th apostle. Day of Pentecost comes, 12 men filled with the Holy Spirit, baptized with the Holy Spirit, and they began to preach. <clears throat> and they preached in the first 12 chapters, the 12 preach. Peter, James, and John preach, Peter and John preach, and uh, Philip preaches, and Stephen preaches, and they're all tied to the 12 or the, uh, uh, the seven chosen in Acts chapter 6. Now, when you get to chapter uh, 10, uh, it is Peter going to Cornelius. The whole chapter is, is Peter going to Cornelius, a Gentile. And many people like to make reference to the fact that Peter went to a Gentile, and therefore Peter brought Gentiles into the church. Well, he brought Cornelius, a Gentile, into the church that he was preaching to. That's a fact. But he wasn't preaching to the same church that Paul was preaching to. Now, I know that's a big controversy. You know, all of a sudden I become a, a hyper-dispensationist just because I said that, which is, of course, not true. But also... Now we see something else after Acts chapter 10. We see a diminishing of the 12 apostles. I don't mean a diminishing of them as, as uh, ministers of God or a diminishing of them as having something wrong with their doctrine. They're doing exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ taught them to do. They're teaching people to add to the number that they were in, and they were in a number referred to as the little flock the Israel of God, and the new Israel. A, and, to, and by the way, unto a nation, they were called a nation, bringing forth the fruits of the kingdom of God. Jesus called them that in Matthew chapter 23, and, um, and or 21, whichever. I've got that backwards, I think. But anyway, that's what they were known as. To the people that they preached to, they were well known because they were filled with the Holy Spirit. They did exactly what Jesus Christ wanted them to do. They feel, fulfilled their ministry. Uh, and just because we don't get to read about the fulfillment of their ministry, they were, go, they, they were ministering on, even as we'll see today, they were ministering on a long time after the emphasis in the book of Acts is taken completely away from the 12 apostles. And I believe it starts, that taking away from the 12 apostles, the emphasis of the book of Acts, I believe it actually starts here in Acts chapter 12. See, Peter's been put in prison because Herod killed James, the brother of John, with a sword, and he saw that it, <clears throat> that it pleased the Jews, and so he imprisoned Peter. But I want you to notice now that in Acts chapter 12, as Peter was in prison, 
It says, verse 6, And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Verse 7, And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in the prison. Now, just a side note about the angel of the Lord. That is the angel which represents our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You can see him spelled out clearly right down to a description of him in Revelation chapter 1. I recommend you read that on your own. Verse 7, Behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and a light shined in prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Rise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands. And the angel said unto him, Gird thyself, and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he, and he saith unto him, Cast thy garment about thee, and follow me. And he went out and followed him, and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw a vision. When they were past the first and second ward, they came unto the iron gate that leadeth unto the city, which opened to them of his own accord, and they went out and passed on through one street, and forthwith the angel departed from him. Now here's the thing. Here's Peter standing in the middle of the street through the presence, power, and personage of the Lord Jesus Christ in the angel of the Lord's uh, uh, vis visage. Now, there he stands. And now he knows it wasn't a vision because he's standing out there in the middle of the street. Now, this is Peter, folks. This is the man who said, silver and gold have I none, such as I have get uh, give I unto thee, rise up and walk. It's the man who said to the Sanhedrin, we ought to obey God rather than men. And now he stands here in the middle of the street and he doesn't pro project in any will, uh, I mean any power against the will of those who would um, malign him and so forth. Watch what he does. Um, verse 12. And when he had considered the thing, he came to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose surname was Mark, uh, where many were gathered together praying. And as Peter uh, knocked at the door of the gate, a damsel came to hearken named Rhoda. And when she knew Peter's voice, she opened not the gate for gladness, but ran in and told how Peter stood before the gate. Isn't it fascinating that Peter was standing before the gate instead of just going in? Was there a guard dog? What was he afraid of? See, I, I'm not trying to put down Peter here. I'm trying to get you to see the reality of that which is occurring in the book of Acts. Read on. Verse 15, and they said unto her, thou art mad, but she constantly affirmed that it was even so. Then said they, it is his angel. But Peter continued knocking, and when they had opened the door and saw him, they were astonished. But he, now we're talking about Peter here. But he, beckoning unto them with the hand to hold their peace, declared unto them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. And he said, and he said, well, now I'm going to get on with my ministry here. Hmm. That was what he said. And he said, go show these things unto James. Not James, the brother of John. James, the brother of John had already been killed. Before Peter was put in prison, James, brother John, was already killed. So he says, go show these things unto James and to the brethren. And he, Peter, departed and went unto another place. Where'd he go? I don't know. You don't know. Where'd he go? I got an idea where he went because he wrote a letter from there when he got there. And if you'll read First Corinthians, uh, First Peter straight through at the end of it, you'll see where he went. Now, my point is not picking on Peter here. My point is that this was the angel of the Lord that got him out of prison. And instead of doing the things that you would expect him to do as Peter, the appointed of the Lord, he did other things. And that's okay because the spirit of the Lord be still being with him. The spirit of the Lord was leading him all the way. And in fact, he shows up actually twice more in the book of Acts. He shows up in Acts chapter um, uh, 15 and speaks. But then he shows up in Acts chapter 21 
regardless of what anyone says about this, he shows up in Acts chapter 21 as one of the elders. Because in 1 Corinthians, ah, uh, 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter calls himself an elder. I, I myself am an elder. In Matt. In Acts chapter 21, the Bible says when Paul got to Jerusalem, he, he went in unto the, to the church there, and all the elders were present. But those are the only two times you will find Peter after he went unto another place. In the book of Acts, this is only chapter 12 of the book of Acts. There's 16 more chapters, folks. Who's the prominent preacher? Paul is. Now, look in Acts chapter 13, verse 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene and Manian, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. And so they were separated, and they went out, and they went out to do something that the Lord, that the, according to the Holy Ghost, had called them unto. Now, if you'll notice in, chap in chapter 13, uh, you'll see that, um, that Saul, uh, Paul's name comes to him in, in uh, verse uh, 9. He's called Saul, and then he also is called Paul, and from here on in the Bible, except when he is quoting the Lord, uh, or the Lord is being quoted about his salvation, he's called Paul. And so it goes, Saul is a Jewish name having to do with being uh, desired above all uh, other uh, uh, surrounding people, like a, as in the case of King Saul. <clears throat> but Paul, as a, a, a Greek word, uh, is, has to do with diminished or small or little, uh, not, not of great importance that kind of thing. So anyway, now it's Paul. The book of Acts, 16 chapters, more, uh, almost all of it is about Paul. Well, that's okay. You know why that's okay? We didn't write that. We, we can depend on the Lord to have written that. Okay? Now, in Acts chapter 13, he goes, that when they leave there, they're, they're in Antioch, and that Antioch is in Syria. When they leave there, they go to an island. And on that island, they go to a town. Uh, they, they stopped at another town before they went to that island, but they don't, it doesn't mention that they did anything there as far as preaching. But then they go to this island, they preach the word of God in the synagogues in Salamis, which is on the island of Cyprus. So I believe that between Acts chapter 13, verse 1, and the end of chapter 14, I believe that Paul and Barnabas were responsible for the start and continuation of 10 churches. Now, I'm not going to take the time to go through them, uh, but you can, when you read there, you just underline all the city names that you see. Don't duplicate any, and count the first one where they were at, at Antioch. And then count all the rest of them until you get to chapter, the end of chapter 14. And I think you'll find that it's 10 churches that he started. Uh, you say, well, some of, some of these places mentioned are not necessarily a town or a city. Well, that's true, but there's a ministry that went on there. And so you don't have to, you can find people who live in a country, you know. So I want you to now look at the end of chapter um, uh, 14. Go to the end of chapter 14 and look with me in verse um 26. It says, and thence, you can insert the pronoun they there because it starts in verse 24, and thence sailed to Antioch from whence they had been recommended to the grace of God for the work which they fulfill. Don't miss the word. Here's the deal. They started out, this is uh, Israel down here, and this is Syria right here. They started out in Antioch in Syria. He goes, they go out here, they go to this island, 
and they go and they go to all of this land mass over here, which today is called Turkey. They went to the southern portion of it like that, and they went from Antioch to here. All these, another Antioch up there, and and then back to Antioch right there. Okay, they just made a big loop there. It took them somewhere between nine and eleven years, depending on how you count the years in the Bible. And it says in verse 26, they went back to Antioch from whence they started for a work which they fulfilled. Now, next you're going to be in Acts chapter 15, and this is when there's been some people do some wrong things down in the Galatian area. Look at chapter 15, verse 1. And certain men which came down from Judea talked the brethren and said, except you be circumcised, and blah, blah, blah. And so Peter, I said Peter, Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, take Titus with them, and go to Jerusalem to discuss this matter, not to ask permission to do anything, but to discuss with them this matter. And the 12 apostles, uh, now that James is in some form of leadership, and the apostle Paul called him an apostle, they're back up to 12 apostles. The 12 apostles wrote a letter and sent it out by Silas uh, and another man, and uh, at the end of Acts chapter 15, Barnabas takes Mark and goes in a different direction, and Paul takes Silas and goes in another direction. Now, here's the thing. It is an argument. It is a, dif it is a disagreement between Barnabas and uh, Paul. But it's as it should be. You know why? Yes, you do. Acts chapter 14, verse 26 said that they had fulfilled their ministry together. Barnabas and Paul had a ministry, lasted 11 years, whatever, together in all those places, back and forth in there. But in Acts chapter 15, that comes to an end. And then, and, and in fact, Acts chapter 15, they did no more than, than go back and look and see how people were doing. Now, notice that they, when they wanted to, when they separated, they were had been doing that some, and, and so then they, they, they wanted to go different ways. If you look at the last uh, two verses, I'm sorry, look at the last three verses, verse 39, and the contention was so sharp between them that they departed asunder one from the other, and so Barnabas took Mark and sailed into Cyprus. And Paul chose Silas and departed, being recommended by the brethren unto the grace of God. Not so. It didn't say that Barnabas and Mark were recommended uh, by the brethren unto the grace of God, but it does about Paul. I'm not trying to pick on anybody. I'm just looking at the words on the page, folks. Verse 41, and he went through Syria and Cilicia, all of this land up in here, including the Syria where he started, and it says, confirming the churches. Now, in chapter 16, they come to two of those places, Derby and Lystra, they choose Timothy to go with them, and so they go forth and carrying out those things that were uh, given unto them by the 12 apostles. Verse 4, chapter 16, verse 4, and as they went through the cities, they delivered them the decrees for to keep that were ordained of the apostles and elders which were at Jerusalem, and so were the churches established in the faith and increased in the number daily. Now, I want you to consider what, what I just read there. You got this Antioch. You got the other Antioch. You got nine, uh, eight more besides them, um, besides the two Antiochs, and they're all in this kind of an area here. How many is that? Uh, five, six. That's the other thing. Anyway, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So, so they're established because they needed to know what those... Um, uh, um, decrees were that were ordained of the apostles and elders, and that's, that's helped to establish them in their understanding of what they're supposed to do with the message that they have. But there's a problem, and you don't see the problem here in Acts chapter 16 because there's no reason for it to have been made prevalent in Acts chapter 16, because in the book of Acts, you're talking about the acts of the apostles, you're not talking about the arguments. The contention between Barnabas and, and Paul is to show why they separated. They've been together for 11 years, for crying out loud. And so the contention is not the issue. 
even though there's things that you can show that you can find in scripture there that supports one side or the other side or what or, or a reason for there to be great reconciliation later i mean that's fairly common in, amongst the people of god but the issue that the detail of the argument is neither here nor there the fact is their ministry was done and we already had a piece of scripture to tell us that their ministry was fulfilled so we ought not to think harsh, harshly or badly about either one of them. They didn't do anything wrong. They just got on with what the Lord had them to do. Now, as they try, as they move through here <clears throat> in Acts chapter 16, verse 6 says, now when they've gone throughout, this is Paul, he's got Silas with him, he's got Titus with him, and he's picked up Timothy in the earlier verses. In verse 6, now, when they'd gone through throughout Phrygia and the region of Galatia, all those 10 places, and were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. Here's what Paul evidently wanted to do. They come through and they do all of this here, and they get down into this area right here. Paul wants to go this way. But the Lord says, no, can't go that way. Can't do that. So they're, you know, praying, seeking the Lord out. Look how it reads next. And after they were come to Mysia, so they go up the coast here. They start out by here, and then they go up here to Mysia. And evidently, tried it again. Look at that. After they were come to Mysia, they essayed to go to, into Bithynia, which is over here. But the Spirit suffered them not. No. No. I'll take that off. They didn't get a go there. Well, why not? Well, if I read Romans chapter 15 properly, and I read 2 Corinthians chapter 12 properly, I will get to know, or 10, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 10 properly, I'll get to know that Paul did not go preach where anyone else had named Christ. In other words, he didn't go where another man's ministry was. He went to what the Lord showed him his ministry was to be. And twice he tried to go east here, and the Lord didn't show him any way possible for him to do so. Well, turn to 1 Peter. Hold on to Galatians 1 and turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. I think I'll show you why. Now, I believe this is why. If you don't believe this is why the Lord stopped him, I don't care. I don't think we'll lose friendship over it. Just something that I believe. To me, this makes it clear. If it doesn't make it clear to you, okay. But look at this. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Oh, by the way, remember, this is all Gentile country. Massive Gentile country. And if you think of kidding about massive, just go look at population centers of the world and go back through history. You'll find out there was a bunch of people up there. And now look at verse 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. Pontus, Galatia. Uh, by the way, Galatia come up a mountain, across a mountain range like this, and extended up into this, this, this part of this country up here. Galatia, uh, Cappadocia, and Bithynia. Why didn't Paul go east because peter had written those jews the strangers in that gentile country up there peter had written them a letter so you can't prove that well maybe not sure looks like it as a matter of fact down here's jerusalem antioch in syria and when peter wrote this He's in Babylon. Look at chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Verse 13. As he ends this letter, he says, The church that is at Babylon, elected together with you, saluteth you, and so doth Marcus, my son. If you want to know what I think, let me just give you a hint about what I think. I think I could be wrong, but I think that Peter 
wrote First Peter in Acts chapter 12. And when he went into another place, it is not mentioned where he went, so I can't say that this is exactly right. But think about it. He was in, he was visiting in the home of John Mark. He went into another place, and the Bible doesn't tell us where he went. When he writes first Peter. He's, in, he's obviously at Babylon because the church that is at Babylon saluted these people that he was writing to who were up in here. So from way over here, he writes 1 Peter and it goes to a bunch of people that are up in there who are strangers in all those Gentile lands, all Jews scattered at Acts chapter 8. No, well, it's all right. You don't have to believe that. That's just how I see that. Now, the reason I see it like that is because Peter is nondescript in the rest of the book of Acts. And yet he writes 1 Peter, and then he writes 2 Peter. And if you try to figure out when he wrote them, you don't come any better at, at that. I mean, it's no, it isn't any clearer for anything that you might surmise than it is on the things that I surmise. I think he wrote 1 Peter in Acts chapter 12. I think he wrote 2 Peter after Acts chapter 20. Just my way of thinking. And there again, see, that's that's really not, I'm sorry to have done that, that's really not pertinent to what I want you to see about Paul and the ministry that he performed. But, it, but there's a thing that happens in Galatians, in the book of Galatians, that I want you to go back to now, go to Galatians chapter 1. I believe he wrote the book of Galatians right there in Acts chapter 16 before he went to Philippi. The reason I believe that is because of carrying those decrees for to keep, which were ordained by the apostles at Jerusalem. And he left those things in their hands as decrees for to keep because they needed them. They were in violation of some things. And it was troublesome to any of the Jews that they would have ever come in contact with for them to do that. Well, why were they doing it? Well, they're Gentiles. The bulk of them were Gentiles. And so he, they, by the ordinances, he took away the things that the Gentiles would have thought be, would be the hardest thing to get rid of. And so that troubled Paul because he had to carry those ordinances to them to keep from being offensive. And so he describes to the Galatian churches, chapter 1, verse 2, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, that's 10 in number. And when he did that, he gave them a reason for those ordinances to not be necessary. So, but he carried them there. Yeah, he agreed to carry them there. For those churches to be established in the faith was to understand that they can't go around offending people uh, in the sight of God with things they were doing being contrary to the law of God, which they have been redeemed from. So there they are, perfectly redeemed from the law, and yet they're violating things right in front of all those Jews who could not understand how you could be uh, redeemed from under the law. Did I make anything up there? I don't think so. Don't think I did. Look in Galatians chapter 1, verse 6. He says to these 10 churches, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. What were they doing? Well, according to chapter 50, Acts chapter 15, verse 1 and 2, they were going over there and telling those people, you've got to be circumcised or else you can't be uh, 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 enter into the kingdom of God. Well, Paul knew that wasn't true. And he stopped that from happening by going in there to Jerusalem. And he got four simple little things that they said, okay, it, it, we that we're not putting the Gentiles under the law, but how about remembering these four things for our sake? 
And so Paul delivers those things, and it must have grieved him at his heart that he even had to, to deliver those four things to people who had been saved by the gospel of Christ, by the power of God unto salvation, how that Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised for our justification. The law was taken out of the way, and on and on and on. And then he says, oh, my gosh. You've gone to a perverted version of the gospel to satisfy some bit of the flesh. You think you're going to prove something to God with this? Look what you had. Look what you've forgotten. Look what you have given up and, and taken on yourself instead of just praising God for his grace. Now I realize that those words are my words made up out of Paul saying, I marvel, you're so soon removed, etc., etc. But notice what he said, verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you. He was there 11 years, folks, preaching the gospel of Christ. Remember Acts chapter 13, verse 38 and 39? First time he preached in those two chapters, he said, through this man, Jesus Christ, is preached unto you the forgiveness of sins, and by him all that believe are justified from all things which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. He preached the gospel of Christ clear as a bell. He never let anyone think that he was doing anything other than preaching the gospel of Christ to these folks. And now he says, don't be listening to another version of that. Me or an angel. Verse 9, as we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel uh, unto you than that you have received, let him be accursed. You see, a lot of people think that, uh, that when, when Paul said that, that Paul and Peter had been preaching the same gospel. Well, that would make Paul accursed. Because in this, if, if I'm right about this being the first book that he wrote, he wrote 12 more in which he preached another gospel, clear as bell, don't you think? If this was the same gospel Peter and the, the rest of the apostles were preaching, see what I mean? Peter and Paul never did preach the same gospel. I've, I've said to people, in uh, some, some of them preachers, some of them not preachers, but in active in denominational churches, I've said to them, Peter and Paul preached different gospels. Oh, no, they did not. There's only one gospel. I said, well, there's one saving gospel for us, but Peter and Paul both didn't preach that. Well, sure they did. They're both apostles. I said, well, could you show me in the Bible that they preached the same gospel? And you know why no one ever has? Because there's no Bible that says they preached the same gospel. Simple as that. And praise God for it. I'm very happy that Peter and Paul didn't preach the same gospel. I'm sure you are too. Now, here's the thing. He's got this problem with these Galatians, and they're forgetting some of the things that they need to remember about who they are. And that's what the book is about. Chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, chapter 4, 5, 6. It's all about the same thing. And it's a great picture of the confusion brought about by denominational systems. Just the other day, I was talking to a man who asked me, uh, I told him that I had pastored churches for a long time. He said, what denomination? I said, none. And he said, <laughs> okay. And I said, well, I said, uh, a lady asked me one night how long I'd been a Baptist preacher. And uh, I told her I wasn't a Baptist preacher. And she said, what denomination? And I said, non-denominational. And a friend that was standing by, mutual friend, she says, well, Jerry, don't do that. You just lied to her. And I said, what? You didn't lie to her. She said, yes, you did. You're not non-denominational. You're anti-denominational. Well, I told that to this man, and he laughed out loud. And he said, well, I guess I am too, because he said, I don't like him. He said, I, I'm a Christian, and I go to this particular denomination church. But he said, I don't think there ought to be any either. I said, well, think about why there are some. Why there are 2,500 major ones. Why there are thousands upon thousands of independent ones. And why is it that that's okay with people? Do they really think the Lord Jesus Christ is glorified in all those denominations and uh, non-denominational churches? And he says, well, I don't know about that. That'd be a good question. I said, well, I can tell you. If you listen to them on radio, television, and YouTube, and all those other places that you can find these people, you'll 
find out real quickly that the Lord Jesus Christ isn't getting glorified. It's either that somebody's always trying to glorify the preacher, give him or her some great accolade, or they're glorifying the voices of their singers, or they're doing some fleshly act that makes people think that they're, wow, they must be of God. Look at them do this. Pitiful. Paul says they are accursed. Well, accursed doesn't automatically mean they're sent to hell. It means nothing that they're doing is blessed of the Lord. But if you think about somebody preaching a message which is contrary to the gospel of Christ as the power of God and salvation, and they thrive. They get a lot of money, they get a lot of people there, and the people generate a lot of money, and they build a big building, and then on and on and on it goes, and they get to be well-known, and on and on. And all the time, they're preaching either a perverted gospel, as Paul talks to these people about, or one just altogether wrong, such as picking up the gospel of the kingdom, claiming Israel's blessings and Israel's promises and Israel's inheritances, instead of looking to the church, the body of Christ, and seeing it as Paul presented it. It doesn't matter how sincere the man is. It doesn't matter how much Bible he reads. If he presents a wrong gospel, nothing about that is being blessed of the Lord. Well, who would be blessing him? I've had women say that to me. Well, where do you think these blessings came from? I said, they came from the devil. Oh, that really makes him angry. Well, I don't believe, it. I don't blame them. If I were them, I'd get angry and some little pipsqueak like me says that either. either. I'd say, well, you know, you go your way, I'll go mine, which is basically what all of them did say. It just that doesn't change anything. It is either correct with the word of God, or it's a perversion. And remember, how that Christ died for our sins means how that he died for our sins, and then it says, according to the scriptures. If Christ died for our sin, our sins in such a way that it is Christ dying for our sins, then it had to be according to the scriptures that defined what it takes to rid ourselves of the sin curse. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and was buried, and then it says, and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. You see, it has to be according to the way the Lord said things had to be done in the scriptures. And you can read Isaiah 53. You can read the last three chapters of Hosea. You can read Zechariah 11, 12, and 13. I mean, come on, folks. There's places in there that you can, if you just look through the prophecy, you're going to see it is according to that. At, uh, Psalm chapter 12 uh, and Psalm chapter 16, Psalm chapter 1, and Psalm chapter 2. I mean, it goes on and on. Psalm 23, you'll see everything. How that Christ died for our sins is according to scriptures. Now, Paul preached that. That was his message. Now, notice here, he, let's get it. In the, in the Galatian letter, he is explaining how come something has to be said here about these people's problem. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him and on and on. And he says in verse 11, he says, but I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached to me is not after man, for I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. He separates himself from the 12 apostles as far as the ministry goes, because he got the message of the gospel he preached, and he got it directly by revelation from Jesus Christ. And he points out how he was um, uh, uh, gathered unto this by the Lord himself. He said, verse uh, 13, for you've heard uh, of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God. He calls it the church of God because it was the church of God. In Paul's day, in Paul's day before his conversion, there was only one church of God. It wasn't the religion of the Jews. It was the church of God as, as was being led by the 12 apostles, and that's the one he persecuted. Um, 
and wasted it. He said, verse 14, and profited in the Jews' religion, above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of, watch now, my fathers. He didn't say the, uh, the father of our, of our nation. He said, my fathers. He was more exceedingly uh, zealous of the traditions of his own fathers. You remember he sat at the, at the, he was taught and was sat at the seat of Gamaliel? We'll read what Jesus uh, encountered about Gamaliel in, uh, in the Gospels. I forget which one that's in, but it's one in that he's quoted in there. Listen to what he says. And Paul could see that. Yep, it was right to kill Jesus. Well, if it was right to kill Jesus, then it was right to kill Stephen. And that's what caused the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, back to the passage. He says, but, verse 15, but when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood, neither went I up to Jerusalem. And then it, it, the next, next verse then says, after three years, he went up there. I don't care how you figure out the three years. It make a difference to me. It was the Lord's will, and it's in verse 17, but it doesn't make a difference to me how mankind has figured out where Paul was at for three years. I don't care. I know that he went to Jerusalem after three years. So it says, verse 18, that after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him 15 days, but other of the apostles saw I none say James, the Lord's brother. James, the Lord's brother, is called an apostle by Paul right there. Now look in chapter 2. Now Paul is describing when he goes to Jerusalem to settle some questions, and it wasn't going up there to get anybody's permission to preach. It wasn't going up there to say, is it okay if I say so-and-so and you say so-and-so? He just went up there to tell them what he was doing, and they glorified God for it, and they saw to it that there was another way around all these problems. And it doesn't fix it in Acts chapter 15. It fixes it right here in Galatians chapter 2. So he goes in to talk to him, and there's some people talking uh, about him, and so on and so forth. Verse 5, to whom we gave place by subjection. I'm sorry, I'm in uh, Galatians 2, 5. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Do you see what he just did? He just said the truth of the gospel. He's the one that preached all these Galatians. He's the one with Barnabas that started all those churches. He says that the truth of the gospel, well, that would be the gospel they heard, according to verse 6, 7, 8, 9, that back in chapter 1. And he says, you can't take another gospel. It will cause you to be accursed. So he says uh, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. Now watch verse 6. But of these who seem to be somewhat, there they were. He was amongst the apostles, and James was their, at least uh, verbally, James was their leader. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it make it no matter to me, God accepted no man's person. But they who seem to be somewhat in conference added nothing to me. Paul, can, Paul knew the Old Testament Scripture probably better than any of those 12 men. Paul knew what the Old Testament Scripture said. Paul knew there was a type of himself back there, and he was the recipient of certain things, including the forgiveness of sins, that the prophets had said was going to take place. That's not Paul back there in prophecy. It's a type of Paul, and it appears in three different places. Study that on your own. Now, notice he says... Um, and then that the 12 didn't add anything to him, but he says in verse 7, but contrarywise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, watch now, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. Wow. Now the two gospels are plain and obvious. I mean, as, as to the fact that they're different, one's to the uh, um, uh, uncircumcision, and the other is the circumcision. So watch the next two verses, how this unfolds to show you who it is. When he says in verse uh, 7 he, that the gospel, there was a gospel given to him that was committed unto the uncircumcision. 
gospel of the uncircumcision was committed to Paul. And he says the gospel of the circumcision, which those people in Jerusalem all knew who that was, that was them. But that was committed, committed unto uh, uh, Peter. Now look at verse uh, 8. For he, that would be Jesus Christ, for he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision, the same was mighty in me toward the Gentiles. Well, he said Gentiles. He did. He, I, I just read it. He did. He said Gentiles. So Peter, who in chapter 12 had gone to another place, and I believe from Babylon had written that letter, set First Peter. In First Peter, his gospel is reiterated several times, very clearly, by the way. Now, on the other hand, now, Paul, the only thing Paul had written to this point is this book you're reading, Galatians. And in Galatians, he lays out the difference between the two gospels, not the content of all the uh, scriptural words that go along with the explanation of the gospels, but the fact that there is a difference and there is a difference as to who they went to. But this one, Peter wrote concerning the gospel of the circumcision. And in the context of Galatians chapter 2, circumcision, that's only called the circumcision, the circumcision, the circumcision in verse uh, uh, 7, 8, and 9. Three straight times, Peter's message is to the circumcisions of the circumcision. It's for the circumcision, verse, verse 8. Um, he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. It was the, the gospel of the circumcision uh, in verse 7. Notice in verse 9. And when James, Cephas, that's Peter, and John, who seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace that was given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hands of fellowship that we should go unto the heathen, and they, and you can insert the word go there, go unto the circumcision. So you got up here, you got the, Paul uh, here in Galatians, he says three different uh, uh, kinds of, of word uh, definitions. One is the uncircumcision, that's the gospel of the uncircumcision, and it's going to go to uh, the Gentiles, and Gentiles is capitalized, uncircumcision is not capitalized. And then the third thing there, he says, that is to heathen, and that's not capitalized. Uncircumcision and heathen are not capitalized. That's not a specific people. That's people that fit the bill, fit where they're at. They fit the reception of it. And they're primarily, not always, but they're primarily Gentiles. Gentiles is capitalized because it includes everybody who's not a Jew. If if this gospel was understandably Peter's and the 12 apostles' gospel of the circumcision, and the circumcision was known by the law of Moses. He said, well, it's known by Abraham. Yeah, but it's not known by Abraham as being a necessity. Read it carefully. But it was for Peter and the Jews a necessity. Wasn't that way for the heathen? Wasn't that way for the bulk of the Gentiles? That's why the gospel is called the gospel of the uncircumcision. It didn't include anything of a physical nature. Just like why Paul, why did Paul have to write a verse that said, uh, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach, uh, pe to, but the, to preach the cross? Because he had to make the point clear. There's nothing added to the cross, folks. How that Christ died for our sins was perfectly. He was buried. And how that he was raised from the dead was perfectly. And it was according to the way the scriptures defined it to be. Therefore, it was a done deal. When Christ died for our sins, how many did he leave out? None of them. The circumcision had an altogether different picture preached to them about sins. 
And Paul didn't change what the 12 preached. Number one, Paul would not have had the right to have given them a gospel and said, now preach this. Number two, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, also the Lord and Savior of the circumcision, had every right to do what he did because of what he was calling people unto. We're called the church, which is his body. They were called a priesthood of believers. They're called a, 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 a royal uh, priesthood, a kingdom full of priests. We are never called that. We cannot be that. Why? Well, is it because we didn't keep all those laws that they still had to keep? Mm, well, you could say no if you want to, but the fact is he never took the law away from them. And in fact, if you read Matthew chapter 5 and 6, you'll see how much more difficult he made it for those new priests. Peter, James, and John, all the rest of those people, thousands upon thousands of people, ultimately to be 144,000 and have a different kind of inheritance and a different sort of ministry in their eternal life picture. Come on, folks, read the whole thing and stop trying to be a copycat to somebody else. And say what the Lord said to you, for you to say. Now, one more thing, go to chapter 6, Galatians 6. There are five verses here that I believe are, are very much a leadership position in the church, the body of Christ today. In the church Paul was preaching to when he said, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures was buried and was raised again the third day according to the scriptures. When he wrote, he was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. When he wrote, when he said to the Philippian jailer, him and Silas said to the Philippian jailer, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. When he did this, I believe these five verses right here depict our instruction and our need. Right here. Galatians chapter 6, verse 6. Let him that is taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. You take that for whatever it's worth. You do whatever you want to do about that. You know who teaches you. And you know why uh, Paul in another place said, uh, honor to whom honor is due. If someone, someone taught you something from the Bible, you, said, you should say thank you. And then that's not that's not glorifying a man to say thank you for showing me something in the Bible. He says, let him that's taught in the word communicate unto him that teacheth in all good things. Now watch carefully the admonition here. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall of the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. The right, life everlasting there is not the same. It's not saying the same thing as eternal life. Life everlasting has to do with what you are, who you are, and where you are in glory. You read 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and a couple other passages about the judgment seat of Christ. You'll see what I mean. And then he says this. And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season... You shall reap if you faint not. If we faint not, well, if you sowed, but you didn't go to reap, that would be fainting. So it says if you sow to the flesh, you're going to automatically lose out. That would be corruption. Corruption of your flesh, corruption of your attitude in the world, corruption of your time spent in the world, and on and on. Then he says in verse 10, and I believe this is the capstone, as we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. You see, here's the thing about the household of faith. Now, I know that you, if, if you've been around people who have a testimony of salvation, if you, if you, if you know you're being around saved people, and some of them you probably really love, and some of them you just tolerate, and some of them you don't like at all, and some of them you wish they didn't come into your presence. I mean, if you're 
like me. But it says to do good unto them, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. Well, here's why. When you read over in verse 15, he says, for in Christ Jesus, and I didn't get to the part, I'll get back to next week and get back into the part of, oh, no, I won't. I'll come back to that in just a moment. In verse 15, he says, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. You see, if you know people who trust in Christ, if you know them who have a testimony of salvation, believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, know in their testimony that they are saved. They are a new creature. You may not see the new creature. There's a chance probably slim, there's a chance they may not always see that new creature in you. But if you're in Christ, you are a new creature. And when we leave here, as the Lord himself descends from heaven with a shout, the dead in Christ rise first, we which are alive and remain are caught up with them, and together we go out to be with the Lord. Let me tell you something, ladies and gentlemen, we will be the new creatures. I personally think we'll still know one another, but we're going to know them as Christ knows them, we're going to know them as God the Father knows them. And if they're in Christ, they're just like me. I hope just like you. And that's a new creature. So let's not bury ourselves down with not liking these people that we really don't like. Rather, let's buoy ourselves up by knowing that if that individual has a testimony of salvation through Christ Jesus, they're a new creature in Christ. And you have a good reason then to do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. We'll pick up right here next week in the book of Galatians and pick on some more things. But let me tell you about next week. I, I said it again. I won't be here next week. I'm going to be on the road, hopefully visiting some folks that I have not seen in a long, long time. I also hope to visit some folks that uh, need me to visit them. Um, and uh, so we'll be out of town going to Indiana. Um, Lord willing, and then I'll be back here on the 22nd, but I won't be here on the 29th. So I'll be, I won't be here next Sunday, but I will be here the following Sunday, the 22nd. But not, let's see, wait a minute, erase all that. I will not be here next Sunday, I will not be here the 15th, but I will be here the 22nd. And I won't be here the 29th. So this month, it's today, and the 22nd are the only two Bible classes we'll have. Now, if you know people who are trying to sit and watch my stuff on YouTube, I hope maybe, maybe tomorrow by this time, I will have those messages that we could not get to go on there, including today's. We'll, we will have them on YouTube. I've got the promise help, uh, and, and I, I uh, want to take advantage of him and have him help me put those on. Um, and uh, I, they, they will be on YouTube. So again, I won't be here next Sunday. I won't be here the 15th. I will be here the 22nd. And I will not be here the 29th. I appreciate your patience and putting up with me. The, the, the uh, next week I'll be in Indiana. The 15th is at my brother Jack's Bible conference. And we will have had a weekend full of that and, and uh, uh, probably get home in not in, not quite home in time to do the class and then on the 29th Barb and I have to go to Kentucky another issue but uh, anyway that's that's kind of the way the month of May is going to go well, I appreciate your patience with us and appreciate your being here and thank you very much for all that you do for the name of the Lord Jesus Christ bye everybody